The following interview was conducted with Dr. John F. Fessler, Pro Professor Emeritus of Veterinary Clinical Sciences for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, November 10, 2008 at Stewart Center uh, Television Studio. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Thank Tell you. us a little bit about where you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. All right. Uh, Katie, I'm a, I guess I'd say a depression child born in the, in the early part of the 30s. Uh, that's left an indelible impression on my life and values and these kinds of things. Not necessarily conservative values, but nonetheless values. Uh, my parents, uh, my father where, was... What, uh, tell us where you were born. In uh, Toledo, Ohio. Toledo, in Toledo okay. Ohio. I'm a city kid that went, wanted to go to the country, and that's how I ended up in veterinary medicine, this kind of thing. Uh, my father was born in the Wapakoneta area. Uh, a farm kid that left home after graduating from high school at the age of 17, I think because he didn't want the hard work that farming was involved with in, in the early 20s. Uh, went to Toledo, uh, never went to the university. He took some courses at Toledo University, but never even went to the finals or got any credits. Ended up in the banking business uh, and the small loan business, evolving as a manager and eventually a regional manager at the end of his career uh, uh, in small loans and finance. My mother is uh, from a small town in Kansas, Hartford, Kansas, near Emporia, where she was born and raised, the uh, daughter of a, um, of a small newspaper editor and owner. Uh, my grandparents were good friends and, uh, of, of William Allen White, who was the well-known uh, journalist uh, and editor of the Emporia Gazette in Kansas. She, in contrast to dad, was a college graduate from Kansas State, uh, almost got her master's at the University of Minnesota, which kind of sets me up uh, as a 50s high school grad to have to go to the university whether I wanted to or not, basically. Uh, that's what our generation did. Uh, I was uh, fortunate to go to a, a very successful uh, high school in Toledo, the Velvis High School, named for the, the, for the DeVilvis Atomizer Company. <laughs> um, and, uh, Tell us a little about high school, what activities and things that you participated uh, in. I, I was a marginal or sub-marginal student in high school, Katie. Uh, I was in the middle half, but the, in the middle third, but the lower half of my high school class. My academic achievement was uh, late in coming, uh, not high school oriented. I did enjoy uh, musical organizations and sang in the a cappella choir in my senior year and in my church choir, in my adult church choir as a, as a high school student, uh, which has been a lasting uh, kind of interest uh, and uh, volunteer aspect of my life uh, through uh, college and here in West Lafayette. And um, uh, so I didn't, wasn't an athlete, uh, wasn't involved with many sports or uh, extracurricular activities in high school, kind of a, a wasted time from that point of view. So then I went to Ohio State and... Uh, how did you happen to select? How did you happen to go there? Well, uh... That was a bit of a distance from Toledo. Both sets of grandparents were from rural areas and I wanted to be a dirt farmer, basically, as a high school graduate and wanted to go back to the farm. I'd farmed in Kansas, not for my grandparents, but for good friends of theirs uh, in my summertime through high school. So uh, milking cows by hand, uh, slopping the hogs with the skim milk uh, and, and cultivating corn and beans in, in the Flint Hills of Kansas is really what turned me into uh, wanting to be a dirt farmer. So I needed a degree in agriculture and in the process grew up academically, you might say, uh, and then evolved on to veterinary medicine uh, and then my career here at Purdue. But uh, um, Ohio State was probably the only university who would accept me <laughs> by virtue of having marginal academic credentials. My mother had me scared. He says, Jack, you go to Ohio State, you don't measure up, you'll be out of there in six weeks. And I took that seriously, found out that I could achieve, uh, enjoyed the academic life at Ohio State and the career. What was yeah. campus like? Like, and this would be in the 50s and the late 40s? In the 50s, uh, campus life was. Uh, quiet, you know, there weren't uh, 
any national events. Uh, Eisenhower was president, things were, were quiet. Uh, I enjoyed Ohio State football under Woody Hayes. Uh, did not have a lot of extracurricular activities at Ohio State. Uh, did not join a, a fraternity. Uh, I rushed quite a few and found out that wasn't what I was interested in. So I studied uh, mm -hmm. and took my academic uh, uh, challenges seriously. Uh, and was fortunate in that respect and uh, uh, did okay. Did, did okay right. is right. the word for it. Yes. Did you live in a residence house or off campus? No, I lived off campus. Okay. Uh, private homes had rooms, you know, and that was uh, like uh, a dollar a day kind of thing. Uh, my undergraduate education was very inexpensive. I had a job, of all things, in a local restaurant, which part of the pay was uh, meals. And so with inexpensive housing, with, of course, low tuitions, and with, uh, with board provided by the restaurant job of being a short order cook and, and uh, serving on a cafeteria line in, in, in a private restaurant, not one of the dorms, but a private restaurant, I, uh, uh, managed to keep costs low. Good. That engaged my time and effort with studies, and that was, that was it in undergraduate school. Okay. Yeah. Then what came next? Is this, did you go into vet school after that? I, I went into vet school uh, a, about a year later. I worked hard in undergraduate school and graduated uh, in uh, less than four years, so there was a time lapse of about eight or nine months between agriculture and veterinary medicine. And it was my dad, uh, of all things, that inspired me into veterinary medicine. I hadn't thought about it much. I still wanted to be this dirt farmer uh, after graduating from agriculture. And uh, he says, uh, Jack, have you considered uh, further education, uh, graduate school, something like this? He mentioned veterinary medicine. And uh, I had done well in biology um, and in the life sciences and, and thought, by golly, Dad, you know, that makes sense. So sort of on a whimsical uh, suggestion of his, it wasn't so whimsical on his part, but maybe I took it that way, uh, I entered veterinary medicine and then was highly successful, Katie. What school uh, did you go to? Ohio State. Ohio State, again. oh, there, okay. Uh, in between uh, agriculture and veterinary medicine, there was an eight-month eight lapse where I worked for a local electric company, of all things, saved my money, and it paid for my first two years of veterinary school. Very good. And uh, then graduated at the top of my class. <laughs> How was the si what was the size of the class there? Uh, uh, 70 students. Okay. Uh, now the Ohio State has over 100 students, where Purdue still has like 65 sure, or so right. in, in okay. class size. Larger school. Right. Uh, of course, a well-established school. Is that older than Purdue? Oh, yes. Oh, okay. yes. Ohio State's veterinary school uh, is now something like about 140 years old. Okay. Uh, and I think Michigan years. State's is older than Michigan I State's too. is older, too. Sure. Iowa State's is the oldest veterinary oh, school it? in continental United States. Guelph is the oldest one. Guelph, Canada is the oldest one in North America. Oh, okay. But these, these schools like Iowa State, Michigan, Ohio State, uh, University of Pennsylvania, they're all well over 100 years sure, old. Sure, interesting. Yeah, okay. right. All right, now, now that you got your degree, what, tell us what came next. Was there anything before you came to Purdue? No. Okay. Uh, Purdue has been my one and only job out of veterinary school. I was lucky, Katie, in many respects, in that uh, the veterinary school here just opened, as you know. It took its first class in 1959. I came in 60 when I graduated from Ohio State was one of the first young faculty uh, hired here. I did, I did have graduate work and accomplished a master's in the first two years, but... Uh, here at Purdue? At Purdue. Okay. Uh, but was basically involved with teaching and cases and the initiation of the clinical programs from the outset. So okay. I've had the good fortune of knowing all of our veterinary students from the first class until the time I retired. Okay, well that's... Tell us, uh, what was the school like? And that's getting sort of... You came in on the ground. Yeah, I did. Yeah. And the dean would have uh, been, was Erskine Morris? Erskine Morris was the dean that hired me. The mm -hmm. first dean of the veterinary school, you know, was Pat Hutchings. He was the gentleman that with, with President Hovde has helped to establish the veterinary school sure. from the original Department of Veterinary Science. And uh, that Department of Veterinary Science was, uh, what should I say, the first uh, uh, 
influence on the school. Uh, these gentlemen all had PhDs and the idea of Pat Hutchings was that everyone would get a PhD uh, and become a researcher. Uh, this is a great research university, of course. And yet uh, I was apparently the first rebel uh, in that regard in that uh, I had my doctorate of veterinary medicine. I didn't think I needed a PhD to do the things I was interested in. That was uh, treat animals and, uh, and, and serve uh, in that role with the clients. And so uh, I did get a master's in pathology, which was very helpful in many respects. But I, I refused to get a PhD. Uh, Pat Hutchings, on the other hand, died before the first class graduated. He died in something like 1959. The class in the veterinary school had started, but he was unfortunately ill with leukemia. And so many of the new faculty and most of the students didn't have the opportunity sure. to know him. Right. So Erskine was the one that hired me. And we began then to digress into a clinical program uh, you tell us as a little compared bit about to that. the research program. Go well, ahead and tell us a little about that. I was on the ground floor of helping to develop the caseload for, for the teaching hospital. And uh, an important person in that respect is someone that maybe you would like to interview. He'd, he'd be fun for you to have is Dr. Harold Amstutz. Uh, Dr. Amstutz was my professor of veterinary medicine at Ohio State. Uh, and then came here as a department head in 1961. So I had him as a department head for 15 years after he had been my champion professor of medicine at Ohio State. And my only thing I can tell you about that relationship is that I beat him to Purdue by a year. But uh, <laughs> it's okay. he has uh, been a tremendous asset, helped to develop the clinical program of which I was a part as a young member then. and. Uh, now the teaching hospital, of course, is well established. Right. Let's backtrack for the researchers. Could you make a couple of comments what the veterinary science department mm -hmm. tells us? For people studying this, I think it would be good because we're still, from that, the school came. Is that correct? That's right. Okay. Uh, the, the Department of Veterinary Science uh, had researchers in it that were mostly, for the most part, focused on, on livestock diseases, both uh, cattle and swine diseases hog cholera, transmissible gastroenteritis, uh, other infectious and contagious diseases of, of our livestock was, was our uh, origin in, in the Department of Veterinary Science. And many of these people who you know, Jerry Getch, Ed Halderman, mm -hmm. Bob Claflin, uh, so on, uh, were then leaders in establishing the school. Back mm -hmm. Well, how long well, that department was within the School of Agriculture? It was in the School of Agriculture. Even Fred Andrews was a member of that department at one time before he kind of switched back to agriculture and then, of course, administration. Administration, right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Um, how about some growth and expansion of the school, particularly the facilities? How to make a couple of comments on uh, that. Well, that's a paradoxical situation. Uh, Katie, the Purdue Veterinary School is the smallest veterinary school in the country. Other schools that have been established since we have been established, like Tennessee, North Carolina, Louisiana, Florida, Wisconsin, are all larger programs. Uh, President Hovde had the impression that we could have a veterinary school here and it would be excellent but small. And we have met those criteria rather well. Our program has been fully accredited from the outset. In other words, our caseload in the hospital, our research endeavors, uh, were a full program, only interestingly enough, the smallest one in the country. Um, that is somewhat of a handicap in these times because the profession has expanded tremendously with uh, specialties. We now have something like 20 or 21 specialties in the profession just as in human medicine, there's surgery and medicine and radiology and pathology, and public health and preventive medicine, et cetera, et cetera, dermatology, cardiology. And it's been hard for us to maintain a, a representation in all those specialties as might be expected by students on the one hand and the accreditation bodies on the other. So paradoxically, we're the smallest program in the country and yet have retained full accreditation throughout uh, mm -hmm. from the outset. Yeah. Okay, good. How about some outreach uh, and engagement? You have some student exchanges with like the university in Japan. 
Yeah, I've not been involved with okay. that. I've been a guest at other faculty members' homes when the uh, Japanese uh, contingent have been on campus. I've not been to Japan myself mm -hmm. or participated in those kinds of activities personally. Um, but it, it, but you got a chance to interact with this is yes. was something that started over time probably mm -hmm. in the school. Mm -hmm. And, and most of that, it's my understanding, has been small animal oriented. And okay. of course, I've been entirely on the equine right. side and yeah. so on. So, Let's except to know of it and to have participated socially with it, I've not been right. a direct participant Let's, in our international yeah. program. Let's talk about the Equine Health Sciences Fund. Let's talk about equine and okay. your research and how right. you got in on to that. Uh, there's been, I should say, probably three phases to my own personal career. The first 15 years I was involved with building the caseload, uh, getting referrals from practitioners in the state, uh, meeting, of course, uh, Indiana clients that brought their animals to the university for treatment, uh, and of course the, s the student teaching and classroom that's been involved with, with that part of the clinical program. Uh, the second phase of my career from, say, about 1975 for the next 10 to 15 years shifted to a residency training program uh, where the focus was on the resident as compared to the senior student more from the view viewpoint of my own time. And I'm very proud of the residents that we've created. Um, uh, about 15 of them trained under me in that period of time. Again, being a small program, I had one resident at a time. Uh, three of them, uh, full professors elsewhere, here and elsewhere. Uh, many outstanding practitioners and surgeons, uh, interestingly enough, in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, the board certification in surgery is, is a rigorous uh, expectation. And I think New Zealand has something like uh, three or four board certified surgeons and I've trained half of them. <laughs> so, so maybe that's my international outreach, Katie, as compared is. to Japan is to uh, Australia where um, in Melbourne and Adelaide and Brisbane, those veterinarians are, are uh, Purdue trained surgeons. Uh, and then Massey University has a Purdue trained surgeon there and then the the, the most successful equine surgeon in, in New Zealand is a woman uh, in Auckland who does uh, more equine surgery than what they do at Massey University. So, so that's the kind of an impact. Interesting. I'd mentioned one accomplishment for which Purdue is noted. Um, in, in the, the mid-1970s, um, joint surgery, that is, uh, chip fractures in racehorses, they break off chips in their joints from, from the stress of racing. Now that's not the kind of serious injury that Bobero sustained and ended up at the University of Pennsylvania, but small chips and to, to remove those chips so that they wouldn't grind away in the joint and, and lead to arthritis, um, we used to open the joint directly and operate on it with, a, with an incision and it came to our attention that arthroscopic surgery would be possible. And we are the progenitors here at Purdue of arthroscopic surgery in the, in the horse, which has revolutionized internationally uh, equine joint surgery. Uh, my resident at the time, Wayne McElraith, is one of the most highly recognized, if not the most recognized equine surgeon in the world for arthroscopic surgery and all of the things that have evolved since. And now we started out with the carpal joint and the ankle joint of the horse, and now they put the arthroscope in hips and shoulders and elbows and virtually every place. Uh, it was first done in humans, of course, uh, and Wayne, the resident, had the opportunity to go to Michigan State and study with the human component while he was a resident, came back, we started it in the horse, and it's been a transformation of equine surgery that started right here. Very good. Yeah. That's, that's very nice, yeah. Right. Uh, what about the funding and support uh, for some of your research projects uh, and for the school as well? Okay. Uh, the, the second component of my career that 15 years was with uh, both the residents uh, and they had a research component. Uh, you, you try to train their mind as well as their hands when they're residents. 
And uh, I got involved with Dr. Gerald Bottoms in our physiology department. And the two of us, we weren't the only ones, but we made a significant impact on the post-operative care of uh, equine uh, abdominal surgery patients. Um, there's, it's kind of hard to say where to start with this story. Go ahead. When I graduated from Ohio State, the mortality from abdominal surgery in the horse was something like 80%. Now it's down to something like uh, less than 10%. Now why the was the rate so high? Well, why is it still 10%, in other words? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The horse is, has a, has a, uh, a gastrointestinal tract that's very complex. Uh, it's large. Uh, their large colon weighs a couple of hundred pounds. Um, there's portions of the equine abdomen that you cannot see when you do a laparotomy and do abdominal surgery. There's portions of it you can't even feel. And so when a disease affects that portion you can't do anything about, there's still going to be a mortality. Sure. But the big issue during the 70s and Dr. Bottoms and my research, we weren't the only ones, but we made significant contributions to our knowledge about endotoxic shock, which was an important post-operative complication. Uh, we, we were able to uh, study some of the, the uh, metabolic and physiologic changes which occurred in endotoxic shock helped to evaluate some of the drugs that were used in the treatment of it. And so post-operative care wasn't the only component of improving our, our survival rate. Anesthesia improved as well and some technique. But uh, uh, Gerald Bottoms and I had uh, upwards of a million dollars worth of federal grants uh, from NIH of all things, from USDA from the American Quarter Horse Association, from the American College of Veterinary Surgeons, uh, to study endotoxic shock. And again, I would not suggest we were the only contributors, but we made significant contributions to the post-operative care of the equine abdominal surgery patient. So that's helped inch forward uh, right. over my four decades in the, in the profession from 80% mortality down to sure. less than 10%. Sure, very good. I remember Dr. Bob. Yeah. Um, and you helped a lot with yeah, that. Yeah, thank you. You did a lot of the uh, <laughs> literature searches for me before the internet yeah, came on board. That's right. <laughs> the Indiana Horse Council, is that still, uh, what, uh, any comment on that? Uh, I've I not guess. been involved. Uh, I, I guess Is it I, a, just I, a state I, thing or? Uh, yes, it okay. is, but uh, I, I guess uh, I'm enigmatic in that I've been involved with equine patients and surgical care, uh, have not been involved with the equine industry directly. Okay. I haven't okay. owned horses myself or been involved with the horse council and that kind of thing. Okay. Okay. My, my work's been just on campus. All right. The Lafayette Center for Medical Education, did you have any affiliation with that at all? Or Other than that, I knew Lindsay, Wag Lindy, Lindy, oh, okay. Lindy Wagner very well as a personal friend. No, I you didn't, didn't do any didn't teaching do with anything, that. Uh, Downstairs, no. That sure. our, I don't believe any of our clinicians were involved with that part of the program. Local physicians were, Katie. Okay. And of course, our basic science faculty definitely had important roles sure. to play okay. in, in teaching anatomy and physiology okay. and this kind of thing. Okay. Yes. The professional associations, tell us a little about your involvement with the AMVA and the IMVA, too. Okay. Uh, there are two professional associations that I'm quite pleased about. Uh, the American College of Veterinary Surgeons is one of the specialties that came out in, in the mid-60s. And so as a, a young graduate, I was one of the first examinees uh, for the American College of Veterinary Surgeons, passed, uh, and uh, in 1984 was president of the American College of Veterinary Surgeons. And so that's been a national organization basically really an international organization that I'm quite proud to have been a part of and to have been a leader of at one point in time. The other association is the, um, the American Board of Veterinary Specialties. Uh, I served as a delegate to the American Board of Veterinary Specialties for 14 years. Was a, I am a past chairman of the board. And uh, the significance of that board is that during the 70s and 80s, there was a, a considerable proliferation of specialties in our profession. And these needed to be governed and controlled in some way. Uh, to use the human side as an analogy, 
there's something like a hundred plus specialties in human medicine and quite a bit of conflict between those that consider themselves orthopedic surgeons or hand surgeons or orthopedic surgeons and neurosurgeons when it comes to the spine and the neck, for example. We don't have that conflict in veterinary medicine, fortunately. And I think I played a role, hopefully, in developing specialties that had a sound scientific base, that had a critical mass of people that would take that specialty and run with it. And that's when things like uh, dentistry, uh, behavior, uh, and then subspecialties like radiation oncology and these kind of things evolved. Mm -hmm. So uh, I consider uh, myself to have been a, a part of the evolution, the, the organized, constructive evolution of specialties right. in veterinary medicine. You addressed that a little bit earlier. Do you find that more people seem to be going into the vet students going more into specialties and uh, versus, say, a general or a small or large animal? A absolutely. Okay. Uh, that is true. Um, there's quite a bit of interest in small animal now because of the, hu the human animal bond and companion right. animals and this kind of thing, which includes the horse, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, let's see how to, how to phrase this. Um, State the question again. Uh, the, uh, the vet students are going more into specialties uh, versus they, right. but they're still a small or large right. animal. One they're, of the things that, right, path. one of the things that has evolved in veterinary medicine as the specialties have grown has been the concept of, of primary care, like family physicians, uh, s secondary specialty practices and tertiary care, which would be the research-oriented case. Uh, you could say equine abdominal surgery was a tertiary case in the 80s uh, with, with the contributions of both research and, and teamwork care of, of a difficult patient like the equine abdominal surgery patient. Uh, this has now evolved in our profession, Katie, where there's general practitioners, yes, but there are now specialty hospitals uh, mostly small animal, but also equine, that are that have all of the specialists in in one place, mostly metropolitan. Uh, the Lexington, Kentucky area is a good example, not the only one where these practices on the equine side are very highly specialized, very highly developed, and have dermatologists, internists, surgeons, anesthesiologists as a part of their team. Well, what's happened now is the university teaching hospital is trending towards the tertiary care. They're really the research case. You know that in our case from the viewpoint of the oncology program right. here on campus. That's a prime example of tertiary care. Equine abdominal surgery, another prime example. Now, there's an important message here in that the future of teaching students and of training residents has to include the opportunity for students to get into these secondary level practices where they see large volumes of cases and even spend time, as we have with our internship program, with, with uh, private practitioners at, at, at the general level. Mm -hmm. They cannot be exclusively exposed to tertiary care cases in a teaching hospital and expect to go out and start start their own uh, careers very well. Mm -hmm. So there's trends now in the profession that are kind of a step ahead of where our universities and teaching hospitals are because the specialists want more money and less hassles to work in this secondary care level where they see a lot of cases. Uh, and so uh, the universities are having trouble retaining specialists on their faculty because they move into this, yeah, these okay. very progressive practices, and the students and residents need that kind of exposure as well. So right. I think we're on the threshold as a profession and as, as an academic component of that profession of uh, spreading out, diversifying. Okay. We've done that at Purdue here. Uh, you know, we have the emergency center is at the, the Calumet uh, campus, uh, and there's talk of having an equine surgical unit at one of the racetracks at Shelbyville. Uh, I'd like to see that happen mm -hmm. because uh, 
it befits what's happening in the real world as compared right. to the academic world. That brings up a point for the researchers. That Calumet, could you make a couple comments on that? Because that was sort of unique, that center that was set up out there. It, it, it is. It's not. Because we don't have much information in the uh, library. Well, that. well, I don't either since it's all small animal and small sure. animal emergency. But it's, it's a partnership of the university with private practitioners in the Calumet area that run the practice. Uh, it's kind of their practice, but it's on university property. Mm. Uh, and it's an outlet then for our students and residents to spend time there. The same thing would be true if we had this surgical practice, uh, say, at uh, Shelbyville at the, at the racetrack there. Um, Ohio State has done this. Uh, at Marysville, they had a they had a food animal practice. I think they still have a food animal practice, which is about 30 miles away from the Ohio State campus in, mm -hmm. in Columbus. This kind of thing. Uh, Oregon State and Washington State had a similar sort of arrangement. Oregon State's veterinary school at first was exclusively large animal, and the students went to Pullman, Washington, to Washington State to get their small animal component of their education and exposure. Now Oregon State has developed a full, complete program and has built a small animal clinic which has just opened. So right. that's evolved that way. As a result so, of that, right. yeah. So well, we, we, we need more of this uh, uh, real world thinking, <laughs> I would have point. to say. Good point. <laughs> have you been involved with the alumni at all in, at the school or at Ohio State since you got your degree there? No, I'm no. afraid my allegiance is more to Purdue than sure. to Ohio State anymore, and I have not been involved with the alumni group at Ohio. I, I, I was recognized some years ago and, and got a, a Distinguished uh, a Service Award from the Alumni Association uh, and, and have been back to Ohio State a number of times, even to the football games. But uh, I'm afraid my allegiance is to Purdue more sure. than to Ohio State. At this I was going to ask you about awards and honors. Were any others that you would care to that you receive to, to uh, make a comment? Well, I, w I received the Distinguished Service Award from the American College of Veterinary Surgeons uh, some years ago. I've received the Alumni Distinguished Service Award from Ohio State. I received the Distinguished Educator Award from the American Association of Equine Practitioners several years ago at the, at kind of the end of my career. So Very good. I have uh, been recognized in that regard. Yes. Backtracking a little bit on students, have the enrollment uh, and their goals, any comments that how they've changed over time since you've been at the school? You notice that? Uh, uh, any general observations? Stu that? Student interests uh, have always been pretty oriented to general practice and to, f and to large animal except right now the job opportunities are much greater in small animals. So we have students mm. that have gone through the large animal components of our program and even the equine components and have found their better job opportunities on the small animal side even though their wishes are that way. Mm -hmm. There's been an idealistic trend of our students to want to, to go into conservation, wildlife, environmental issues and those jobs are very limited, Katie. Uh, it's an altruistic an idealistic goal for them uh, as far sure. as our environment and our country. Uh, but uh, for example, the specialty of zoo animal veterinary medicine is very complex. It's something like an eight or ten year training program after the DVM degree. Uh, and there aren't that many zoos, of course, or That'd wildlife opportunities for yeah. them. So. They, they drift back into small animal practice where the emphasis is oh, okay. now. Okay. So. This brings us to your post-Purdue activities. Can you tell, share that with us? What's oh, your... uh, Pat and I were uh, never interested in Florida. We weren't that familiar in the Southwest, so we sold our home five years ago and bought a condo. So you West sold your La home here in West Lafayette? Lafayette's home base, okay. you bet. We like to travel. We're gone probably 100 days a year. We travel nationally to our state parks, love that. We were just recently at the Tetons and Yellowstone last month. Uh, travel internationally as uh, the spirit moves us uh, and volunteer here in the community. Uh, I like to build sets for civic theater, uh, singing the Freedom Singers on the 4th of July. And when you retire, you get all the more involved with your church, with uh, Kiwanis as a service club and with, with local things. Uh, 
did not play bridge for years, found it too intense. Now we enjoy playing bridge <laughs> just with friends. So uh, retirement has been the best job I've ever had. <laughs> and uh, uh, there's a couple things about retirement. You know, it doesn't matter what you do, it still takes all the time, for one thing. And you don't want to ask me how important things are that we're doing because uh, uh, they are. they're enjoyable for us. Uh, maybe not uh, maybe not that important, but we're trying to give back right. some too. Do you still keep your home here though? Do you still have your home here? Or no, did no you we sold our home, oh. but we have a condo. We, okay. we live right here in West Lafayette. Okay. Right. What about family? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Okay. Uh, very proud of our family. I have two sons, uh, Pat and I. Uh, they're Harrison grads. Purdue grads. All four of us have a Purdue degree. I have a master's in pathology. Pat has her master's in education. Did you meet your wife here? Uh, uh, no, no. Oh. I, met, I met my wife in, in Michigan, of all things. That's a whole other story. Okay. And uh, uh, our sons uh, are both Purdue grads. Uh, our uh, eldest son uh, graduated in electrical engineering. Uh, kind of a curious story about him. He, from seventh grade, wanted to go to Purdue's engineering schools, and of course we didn't argue with that decision on his part. When he was a senior at Harrison, sitting at the dinner table one night, he says, Dad, why didn't you ever tell me about Stanford or MIT? Well, he always wanted to go to Purdue. Why should I tell him about that? He had the perks of living right here at home. Right. You know? uh, he did get his PhD at Stanford and is now a full professor and associate department head of electrical engineering at the University of Michigan. So we're very proud of him and his Purdue roots and his, of course, academic career. Sure. Our other son, uh, a bit more of a maverick, if you will, he's a graduate of Purdue uh, in the technology program in supervision and management, spent uh, many years uh, in Indianapolis uh, in anything from being a bartender at one extreme to a nightclub operator and manager to being a cold call seller uh, for a company. Came home one time and he said to, our, to, to us, to, to Pat and me, he said, uh, well, I've decided to go to chef school. Well, he had his own money and his resources, so he gets in his pickup truck and he goes out west. Uh, he says, Jim, if you want to go to chef school, why not New York or France? He says, no, Dad, I can't afford that. He went on his own. So he picked uh, the Art Institute in Seattle, drove out there uh, without a car. He rented a car, drove out there, and uh, finished at the top of his class in chef school. I asked him, uh, what are you going to do after chef school? He says, Dad, that's the wrong question. Uh, he's never cooked. <laughs> he's got the credentials to be a, an executive chef for a major company, but he's not pursued that has ended up in the wine industry, uh, Katie, and is very successful as a consultant, a uh, store manager, uh, does charity work in the wine industry in California, uh, married a friend there after a number of years, and uh, is living a successful life in Seattle. Good. Now they're not raising their own grapes at all, do they? No, no, no he's not involved with the vineyards. Uh, okay. So since he married late in life, uh, he doesn't expect, and we don't expect him to have children, uh, Jeff, the oldest son, uh, is married to a California woman, and they both wanted to return to California. They met at Stanford, uh, except Michigan is such a wonderful academic environment, they're quite happy there. She's a Ph.D. clinical psychologist with her, with her own practice in Ann Arbor. Uh, Jim's wife, Kate, is um, a, a paralegal has worked for Amazon.com for many years and has uh, great success in her own right. Uh, and uh, of course, they're both in their late 40s now. So the two grandchildren are in Ann Arbor, tw uh, tw 13 and 11, and the Seattle uh, uh, folks will, will not have. Sure, uh, yes. okay. You got a, a favorite Purdue tradition that you'd like to share with us? Oh, uh, comes to mind. I've got lots of favorite Purdue traditions, but I don't know if there's any one in, in particular. Well, you can mention a couple. It doesn't have to be one. I'd, uh, I'd share with you uh, uh, my involvement with the bell tower. Uh, 
Everyone, yes, I was hoping you'd bring that up. <laughs> every, everyone thinks that I uh, restored Thank the Avalon Hall clock and it ended up in the top of the bell tower, which was kind of my goal at one time, but uh, of course it's not. It's on the ground as a still display, as you know. The Havlin Hall bells are indeed the original bells. Tell us all your involvement with the tower, tower, because I think researchers could, because yeah. there are misunderstandings. They, yes. As you yes. say, they think that the original works is right. up there. Right. Uh, I take it you've seen the the uh, Havlin Hall clock. And uh, it's impressive. That, that's been displayed in the, in the uh, foyer of the Material Science Building. Well, it's not there anymore, and people have come up to me and says, well, where did it go? To back up, uh, I knew about this Havlin Hall clock, which came down, and the Havlin Hall came down, I think, in 1955 or 1956, long before I was on campus, presumably you either. And um, uh, for some reason or other, uh, I was out to the Purdue salvage and saw this tower clock on the ground covered with dirt and grit and knew of it from the mid-60s. Uh, and a good friend of mine, uh, a professor emeritus of entomology, Glenn Laker by name, and I were clock collectors and, and clock restorers and so on. And he and I thought, well, we should take that Havlin Hall clock and restore it for the university. Was he, it in pieces or just laying on the floor? It was just laying on the floor, yes, uh, in parts. Uh, it had parts on it that didn't belong to the clock. In fact, I thought, where does this gear go? Well, it was just laying there and it didn't belong to the clock at all. Well, Glenn Laker died at, a, at, a, at an unexpected early age of 72 in the mid-80s. And so uh, I thought, dag on it, we need to do that. So in 1989 or 90, uh, I made arrangements with Chuck Wise, who was a good friend of mine and, of course, Vice President for Development to restore the clock myself at home. And so it got shipped by the bull gang from salvage to my home and was there for a couple years while I tore it all apart and painted you have it room and got for it, it restored in the basement, oh, sure. Okay. Uh, and uh, my neighbor was John and Swifty Hicks, so they'd come over and had seen it in, in different stages of restoration. And then, uh, thanks to President Baring, there was trouble finding a home for it on campus. The engineering faculty did not want it very much. Uh, and Fred Ford came through material science at one time and uh, while, while Fred Wolf of Schedules in Space were, and I were standing there talking about the fact that'd be a wonderful site for the clock. And so Fred walked up to us and said hi, and we engaged him in the conversation. He says, that needs to happen. Well, it didn't for a long while. And at the dedication of the new wing to Lynn Hall in something like 1991 or 1992, President Baring asked me about the clock. Jack, when's this clock going to get displayed? And so I told him the story about Fred stopping by and finding Fred Wolf and myself in the atrium of uh, material science and the fact that the dean at the time and the faculty of engineering didn't want it there. And we thought that was an ideal spot for it. And, and President Baring looked at Chuck Wise and said, Chuck, make it happen. <laughs> and so that's all it took. And then there was a nice case that was built for it, which was all glass. And that case warped in the sun because that clock was set up against the west window of, uh, of the uh, material science building and the sun came through those two glass plates and popped the glass. Well, then people began to put uh, trash through the crack in the glass and so the case had to be rebuilt where it still is uh, and uh, was very nicely done by Dave Wood at the carpenter shop. He's quite the craftsman, made a beautiful case for it, and it got set over in the center of the atrium of, uh, of the foyer there, uh, away from the window, and it sat there for many years. Well, lo and behold, it disappeared, and everybody says, Jack, where did the clock go? To complete the story, Katie, you know, the clock in the top of the tower, the bell tower, is a computer clock, and it's just about as reliable as computers. I had great hopes that the original clock mechanism would be displayed as a part of the tower, but that didn't happen. 
And of course, the Haviland Hall clock from the late 1890s is a piece of machinery. Right. Well, it, it isn't a computer. It's very accurate to within like, say, a minute a month, but still not perfect. Uh, when the clock disappeared from material sciences, uh, I didn't know where it went either. But Keith Hawks, the associate uh, head of mechanical engineering, was a friend of mine, uh, is a friend of mine, and, and I got a call. Jack, we've got that clock in the basement. And when they add their new addition to, to mechanical engineering, there's going to be a multi-story atrium in that addition, and that clock's going to be put in motion. So the nine-foot pendulum can swing, and it'll have a dial and keep time. Uh, and of course, it's a perfect site for it because Haviland Hall was the first mechanical engineering building on campus. It's their property. Uh, and it's going to be great to have that mechanical clock, which, Katie, I don't know whether it's going to run or not. That's great. <laughs> it's, it's cleaned up, but uh, whether, whether or not it'll run. Uh, Is, do you know, do, in the back, do, was it a gift or was it, did somebody build it for the old Heaveland Hall? Oh, no. Oh, uh, how did it come it, to the Indira okay. okay, that's a good story because um, the first Haviland Hall built was burned down, obviously. That's a well-known story with the one brick hire. If I'm not, if, I, if I'm correct about this, the second Haviland Hall was nine bricks higher, but that's another story. Uh, I have a memo from the Board of Trustees in something like 1897 or 98, where the Board of Trustees purchased the clock with some help from a woman's organization of all things. There was a woman's guild on campus in the 1890s that had contributed some money. Something like, it cost something like seven or eight hundred dollars to buy this clock mechanism from the Howard Clock Company. Uh, and I tried to follow up on that clock with the Howard Clock Company, but because they were still in business in the 1950s, but their records were all destroyed. So there is, I have, I have a copy of their log where the Purdue College bought the clock in something like 1897, but interestingly enough, the clock is dated in two places, 1899. So that's on the clock. That's uh, uh, imprinted into the metal at one spot and then decaled on the top, stenciled on the top in, in another spot. Um, the, the Board of Trustees bought the clock and two heifers for the ag farm at that particular decision-making time. So I'm pleased that the clock will have a new home. Mechanical engineering is fully capable of making that piece of machinery operational. That's and, great. Uh, with I, or without my help. But you've got to get some sort of a plaque because people are going to want to you know, know that little bit of the background I think would be helpful. To have uh, I, in, indeed, and I'm to confident that, that, right. that Keith Hawks will will put that together. Right. That's very. Well. I, right. I've been. Yeah. I love that, and I've yeah. always enjoyed it. It's been nice for people and going on in there. Outstanding event in your life. Uh, marrying my wife, I'd have to say. For Sounds well. good. <laughs> Sounds good. And maybe the outstanding event in my life has been a, a successful career in veterinary medicine because. Uh, no one would have known that potential was there as, as a high school student. <laughs> any closing, in closing, any comments that you'd like to share with the researchers looking back and looking ahead and um, mind? Oh, you stumped me with a question you didn't prime me for. Oh, you're, you're okay. So, uh, let's see. I think I would comment about the small size of our school, Katie. Uh, it's uh, as successful as we've been here at Purdue. Having a full program, full accreditation, uh, that's been paradoxically almost a handicap for us. Uh, we're an orphan on the south side of campus and many people, certainly from liberal arts or even from engineering, which of course is the true science. Science and engineering are the strength of this university in agriculture. Um, the profession has outgrown the Purdue Veterinary School in size, uh, and it's becoming a handicap. Small doesn't work anymore. That was President Hubdy's first important impression for our school, that we'd be exceptionally good, 
uh, and have that excellence and yet be small. And that's carried over from with, with uh, John Hicks and others. And fortunately during uh, President Baring's uh, administration, he being a physician, he had some appreciation for teaching hospitals and medical programs. Uh, and it was his contribution of, um, of expanding the, uh, the IU medical program to eight sites in, around the state, of which we became one. That's been helpful in some respects. Um, but now that's even limited in capacity as far as IU Med is concerned. Uh, and our engineering deans, uh, Hanson and Jeske and, and uh, Cordova, uh, have a focus elsewhere. Uh, and at some point in time, uh, the veterinary school, all veterinary schools, in fact, nationwide, have to keep up with the profession. That's, that's, that's a challenge. It, it is a challenge. Sure, right. right. And academic programs are slow to change. Uh, and that doesn't help in our particular case, since the profession's really outgrown its yeah. its academic roots, Don't. which is which I'm very positive about. Oh I yeah, think that right. For the profession itself, that's great. Yeah. But uh, th there's a limitation there. The challenges are there, and we can keep you, moving forward, you which bet. is nice. Right. You bet. Yeah. Thank you very much, Dr. Fessenden. You're welcome. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Have a happy day. Open My pleasure. <laughs>